It's a lot of fun to have friends over to your house, whether it's to eat dinner or to watch a game or to uh, just spend some time together. And it usually it begins the same way every time. You, you meet in the entryway of the home, right? Or it, it could be on the, on the porch and you invite them into your house and you exchange pleasantries here in the, in the entryway. Hi, how are you? So glad you're here. Nice coat, nice shoes. Uh, you took a shower, you know, whatever. I'm so glad to have you come in. And so the, the family comes in and, and eventually you take off the coats, they hang them up and you set them down and then you walk into the, the house and then you sit down and begin to just have conversation. And, wow, I love that picture. That's a nice this and that's a nice that. And you begin to talk. And then the kids run down the hall to play with somebody else's toys. If you've noticed, somebody else's toys are always better than their toys. And so they go down there and play in the toys. And it's just a great time. And you end up having a good couple, maybe two, three hours of just good time of, of visiting. But can you imagine if it happened this way, if you visited somebody's house? And this is pure fiction, okay? This has never happened in the history of mankind. I'm making this story up. I don't want you to think that this has happened to me or I've done this to somebody else. I haven't done any of this story. And so, you open the door and they, they come in and you exchange the same pleasantries. Hi, how are you? Nice shoes. Do you take a shower? Great hair. Hey, glad you're here. And as you walk in, you invite them to sit down and your, your guest to sit down on the couch and he sits down and he says, you know, these colors don't go together. Where did you get this furniture anyway? None of this looks right. And he starts to criticize everything that you have in the house. What, is, or what, what are you cooking? I think it's on fire. <laughs> Burnt offerings unto the Lord. What are we doing in here? <laughs> and then he looks at the carpet and says, when was the last time you vacuumed? You have animals, don't you? He starts to talk about your home in that way. How, how would that feel? Would you all of a sudden start becoming very self-conscious, going, wait a minute, I've watched HTTV, I've, I've gone to the home improvement show, shows, and I've gone to the stores, and I've looked at those books, I know how to put a house together. But then inside of your heart, you're thinking, maybe he's right. Maybe none of this really does go together. So I have stripes and plaid, they don't go together? <laughs> but maybe he's, maybe he's right, and then perhaps inside of your heart, you know he is. You just know. He's right. And when you read the book of Romans, it starts off with nice pleasantries. In fact, when you start the first, up to the verse 16, it's nice, wonderful pleasantries exchange. It's the entryway of the book, and you're explaining it. And all of a sudden, he gets to verse 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel is the power of Christ Jesus to save man. And he gives it the thesis of the book. And then in verse 18, bam, he starts talking about how corrupt man is. Wow, that's, that's kind of brutal, and he explains how bad man is. And you think, well, he's just talking about rebellious man. In fact, that's his thesis in one, chapter 118 through the end of the chapter. It's how rebellious man works, and we all know how rebellious man is. So God gives him over. But that's rebellious man. There's, there's good man or moral man, and he tackles moral man inside of the second chapter all the way through the middle of the third. And he starts talking about how moral man, I'm sorry, he talks about how moral man is in chapter uh, 2, and he says moral man is also bad. Yo, you who judge, do you not do the same things? Gosh, now he's tearing into my living room and how bad my living room is. He, oh, this is bad. Well, what about religious man? He says that man, moral, rebellious man is bad. And then he says that, you know, moral man or good man, the guy who's doing his best, you know those kind, they're just good people. He says they have fallen short of God's standard. And then he gets into ch the later chapter, the next section, and he says, you know what? Religious man is also bad. Terrible. He has fallen short of God's standard. This would never make it in God's economy. It's bad. So rebellious man, we get him. He's bad. Moral man, we thought you just had to be good. He says, no, even moral man who does good pays his taxes, or at least most of them, and he goes to church at least most of the time. He does good things sometimes, more often than not. No, he's bad as well. But what about religious man? He does everything just right. No, he's bad as well. And you can just imagine, you've invited Paul into your mind, you're reading his book, and he's just basically said, everybody is bad. And not just bad, by the time he gets to the middle of chapter 3, he's not just bad, they're dead. When it comes to reaching God's standard of righteousness, man is incapable of doing any of that. He is fall flat on his face. He is that kind of bad. 
man, aren't you kind of ready to send him on his way? <laughs> I mean, good grief, this is a terrible part of the book. You've invited him into your mind space. You've invited him to encourage you and to inspire you. In fact, if you're reading the book of Romans for the first time inside of Rome, you've never even met Paul. You've heard a lot about him, and this is how he's talking to you. What a bummer. This is... I'm going to go ahead and close this book and go back to my best life now <laughs> and forget this idea of what Paul is talking about. But that's how he builds the book, and it's important that he does that because if there's any way that man can save himself, man is going to present that as a possibility. And so Paul, the very beginning, says there's no way that rebellious man can. We kind of knew that. Moral man, not even moral man. Moral man falls woefully short. And then religious man falls woefully short. And when he finishes the, the section in chapter 3, verses 9 through uh, 20, it's man is as bad as man can get. There is none righteous. There's no one who understands. All have turned aside. And when you finish this section, you just feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders because nobody is good enough. When it comes to the standard of God's righteousness, we all fall short. Whether you're rebellious, you think you're good, or you're really religious, we've all Fallen short. And probably one of the greatest trans, uh, contrasts in all of Scripture when it comes to this subject of, of salvation is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. If you have your Bibles, turn to that section because this is a powerful trans contrast. Romans 3, verse 21 he begins to tell us that something has changed. Moral man, religious man, and rebellious man have all fallen short. They're all accountable to God. They've got to meet the standard of God's righteousness or they will not be allowed to have a relationship with God or in the presence of God whatsoever. But now what he says in verse 21, and if you were to have to tear off a part of scripture because it was just ultimately important, it's this section, 21 through 26, is probably the greatest summary of what God has done through Christ Jesus and God's plan for the ages right here in what Paul writes. He says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made manifest, witness, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance of, of for in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ let's back up and look at a couple things here just a couple phrases apart from the law this would tell the religious man or the Jew that this is a righteousness that's independent of the law, of behavior, of modification. You cannot get this kind of righteousness by cleaning up your act, by sobering up, straightening up, acting right. It doesn't happen. The righteousness that God is going to give is apart from you, altogether different separate from anything that you can do. Because as he is displayed in Romans 1, 18 through 3, 10, nobody can do it on their own. This righteousness that he is going to give is completely independent of the law, completely independent of behavior. But he goes on and he uses this word righteousness and it's kind of used in a couple different ways. If you watched Finding Nemo when Crush is running through the, the ERC dude, he says, righteous, righteous. Anyone? Okay, okay, you can admit it. Nemo is a good movie. I like Nemo. Righteous. Well, there's one way of using it. That simply means everything is right. And if you're a turtle going through the ERC, dude, everything is right because this is just where you were supposed to be. It's right. It's used also in the most, when you talk about Noah, the movie coming out in a couple weeks, Noah, that he lived righteously. Well, all that means is that he obeyed the law as much as he could, or in most, Noah's case, not the law, but he walked with God as best that he could. Not that he was perfect. It just means that he lived rightly. But when you apply it to God, it means that he is right everything within himself. There's no contradiction. There's no shifting shadow. He is holy and just, perfect and pure, and everything that he has within him is righteous. There is no battle of sin. There is no compromise with holiness. It is right. We wrestle with sin. God never does. He's right. 
everything is right. And in order for us to have a relationship with Him, we must have that kind of righteousness. And we don't. And we can't. And so when he is using the word righteousness here, it's God's righteousness. Not the idea that everything is just cool. Not the everything that just living correctly. It's that everything within us is in compliance with God. And it's not. And so God, he says here, God is going to give us a righteousness apart from behavior modification. The law. It's been made manifest. This next phrase. It's been made manifest in, uh, in the law and the prophets. That is witnessed. It is testified. It's not new. It's something that God has been uh, bringing along since the beginning. You notice the next part in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. None. One of my favorite things in this thing is the idea of God, that God has acted. You get to the end of chapter 3 or the middle of chapter 3 and you realize that we can't do it. How how are we going to get this? God. God does something. God has made manifest to us a righteousness that we could not get on our own. God has worked and God has moved in such a powerful way that we now have something that we could not achieve on our own. It comes from God. God. Notice how he does this. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. It is God who is going to give this to us. It is a gift. It is simple faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe. There's no distinction. None whatsoever. In the culture of Romans, in in biblical times, there's Jew and there's Gentile, and he says there's no difference. Everybody has fallen short, and everybody needs the same cure. Everyone needs the same answer. It comes through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness that we so needed comes from God. And then notice being justified. And there's this big word there, justify. What does it mean? It simply means to declare something righteous. How many of you have stood in front of a judge before for a ticket? I've had the opportunity to do that. Yes, thank you for being brave. I've done it a couple times, as a matter of fact. And uh, Long stories, but I remember one time I stood in front of a judge. I was in line waiting, as oftentimes happens, and I got to hear everybody plead their case before the judge, okay? But I was in a hurry. Well, duh, that's why you're here. I didn't see the sign. Well, yeah, well, duh, that's why you broke the law. And so the judge is gracious enough to hear the case, okay? He hears the person in front of you, and the person in front of you is giving all the excuses. And if the judge heard the excuse of why they broke the law, and he says, you know what? You seem like a nice person. I'm just going to pretend this didn't happen and we'll just forget about it. What just occurred there was the breaking of the law. Because the law said that if you speed, if you turn wrong, if you do something illegal, you must pay a fine. There's a price that must be paid. And so if the judge says, well, we'll just look the other way, the judge has just broken the law. And it's the same thing with God in his infinite wisdom and mercy. He cannot look at somebody who is sinful, mankind, and say, well, you know what, I'm a nice, loving God. I like people. Good grief, I made them. They've made some mistakes. We'll just do this. Impossible. Because God is righteous. That must be paid. That penalty has to be paid. Because God will not break his law at all, ever. And so when Christ died on the cross, he paid that price. And God is now able to justify justly those who put their faith in Christ Jesus. He's able to declare something righteous. Not because he's ignoring the standard, pretending it didn't happen, the violation never occurred. It's because the price has been fully paid in Christ. He is able to justify or declare one righteous righteous. Not because of something they did, but because of what Christ did. And that's why it's key. You see the kernels in here. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe in verse 22. Being justified how? As a gift. By His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God justified. A couple other big words in here. Redemption is to purchase something back. He buys mankind back. He made the purchase. The next one in there is the word propitiation. I love saying that word, propitiation. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. It's a big fat word that basically means God is satisfied. The price has been paid. Penalty has been, not, has been taken care of. It's done. You are free. 
God is satisfied. We've heard a lot about the wrath of God. No more. There's no more wrath. God is not angry. The wrath of God has been satisfied. It's cured. It's fixed. All in Christ Jesus through His blood. This was to demonstrate in the middle of 25 His righteousness, that God is right. Because of the forbearance of God, He overlooked the sins of the past. And so if you look at it, Christ, God has always seen the cross of Christ. So when Adam and Eve, when Noah, when Moses, when all of the biblical characters in the past sinned, God was able to hold their sin and say, I will pay for that in Christ Jesus. He was looking at the cross. I will pay for that in Christ. I'll take care of that. He's a patient God. I'll pay for that in Christ. And so when Christ is hanging on the cross and when He's dying, it's the sins of the whole human race from the very beginning to the very end, from Genesis 3 to Revelation, the tribulation. All of those sins are placed upon Christ. Every one of them. That's the amount that He paid for everybody's sin. Christ was displayed publicly as a... As a Penalty as the satisfaction of God in Christ Jesus. It was all there. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. And then lastly, he says there, demonstrated. Wasn't a backroom deal. Wasn't something he worked out of the angelic realm. He displayed it publicly for all man to see that it's all about Christ who died on a cross for our sin. And then he says to you and to me, you can have it by faith and then He will declare you righteous. Righteous. So when He looks at you, when you accept Christ as your Savior, He sees righteousness. Isn't that awesome? It, he doesn't see your past in the sense that He's holding it over your head. He doesn't see your future because you're going to sin tomorrow. Somebody told me that. I don't know what you're going to do. But, he, but you're going to sin in the future too. He doesn't see that. He sees you in Christ Jesus, and He has declared you righteous in your His. That's the doctrine of justification. If you were to say you're forgiven, that, that's a wonderful thing too. You're forgiven. But this is injected with positive things in that He looks at you, He smiles. Why? Because you're in Christ. And He loves Christ. You love Christ. We love Christ. It's in Christ. And He smiles. Picture this. Since Naomi was up here just a few moments ago, when Josh and Holly are looking at Naomi in the morning, perhaps Holly's been up late at night because Naomi's having a rough night. Because, oh no, Josh just goes straight to sleep. He doesn't hear anything. No, that's not true. <laughs> okay, well, it was for me. And so we know that, that uh, they had a rough night. And so finally, Naomi goes to sleep. Josh and Holly look over that edge of that crib and they look at Naomi. Do they think of all those things? Oh, she was colicky, or oh, she didn't eat right, or oh, she's just. No, what do they do? We love her. We love her. And they smile. And you did that with your children, and that's what God does to his children. When he looks at you, he smiles. Why? Is it because you did something to demonstrate your rightness? No, no, Romans 1, 18 through 3, 9 tells us you can't. But it's because you've accepted Christ, and he has now declared you Righteous righteous. You're right with God because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And He smiles. And it's a wonderful thing you need to start really grabbing hold of. He's given it to you. He has imputed it to your account. You are righteous. Justified fully because of what Christ did for you and what we'll celebrate in just a second. Last time we talked about grace. That it's an unmerited favor. You couldn't earn it in the past. You can't earn it in the present. You can't earn it in the future. He gives it to you, no strings attached. And then we talked about justification. He has declared you righteous, not because something you did yesterday, something you might do today, and something you could do tomorrow. It's by His grace. He's declared you righteous. And when we talk about the doctrine of eternal security, which will come up eventually, none of these things can be revoked. They're yours permanently, forever. So you are declared righteous in the courtroom of God eternally because you are in Christ Jesus. And you remember the gavel they would strike when you were in court that time? The gavel hits, done. Can't be taken back. And the divine gavel has hit the bench, done. You're righteous. Permanently sealed in Him because of what Christ did for us on the cross. How? Be because of what Christ did, but it's by grace 
through faith in Him. And if you can understand any doctrine, one of the most important ones for you to understand is your salvation. By grace, you are justified freely because of the blood of Christ Jesus.